Welcome to Westminster. Welcome to Westminster. Welcome to Westminster. Welcome to Westminster. Well, welcome to Worship with Westminster. I'm Pastor Chris Ward, and we are so glad that you have joined us today as we come to God's Word once more. We are always uh, so privileged to walk this journey of faith together and always invite you as well to let us know if there are any ways that we can help you uh, in your journey as you continue to grow in faith. Uh, this season of Lent uh, is really a time of, as uh, the church used to say, repentance, um, meaning more than just to say that we're sorry, um, but to actually take some time to, to examine once again how our life is defined, to think again about our thinking, which is literally what repentance means, to think about our thinking and then to act out of a new kind of thinking, a new understanding of the world in ways that better reflect the character and nature of what God created us to be, which means a character and nature of Jesus Christ. Uh, so we, we would really love to help you grow in that as well. If there's anything we can do in this journey, let us know. Uh, let's begin our time with a word of prayer. Father, come and meet us now by your Holy Spirit, wherever we are, Lord, whenever we are engaging with this, uh, may you be present and may your word speak clearly into our hearts, into our lives, that we might reflect you uh, to one another, to our world, and even, Lord, to ourselves, speaking the truth in love, even to our own hearts. And we pray this all in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, let's come to God's word together. So what we believe and what we do, it really does matter. It matters in this world and it matters in our own lives. So if I was to ask you what the most frequent command in Scripture is, what would you say? You know, by far, the most frequent instruction given by God directly or by God's messengers is do not fear. It occurs more than 70 times in Scripture in that form alone of, of do not fear or fear not. Uh, but it's even more than that when you start to count in variations like the positives, take courage or take heart, or the use of synonym, synonyms like do not be discouraged or similar phrases like that. Uh, and it's even more if you add in statements like the one in our passage this morning uh, that aren't actually a command, but instead a statement or talk about a choice. We will not fear or I will take heart. By now, in this topic, we're up to several hundred different passages that all talk about the same thing. So fear is obviously a big deal in Scripture, and that's because fear is a big deal in humankind. So what does Scripture say about fear, and what do we do about it, especially as we look around our world today? Well, before we answer that and get to our text and look at God's gift of safety, which is actually our topic, not fear, but safety, uh, there are a few important things for us to remember about fear. First of all, fear is totally normal, totally natural, and a God-given gift that helps us to survive, right? At its most basic, fear is responding to a threatening situation in a way that it actually acts upon our bodies and our brains in powerful ways that, that help us to get through or out of those dangerous situations. You know, when we are afraid, we are flooded with adrenaline and cortisol, for example, two powerful chemical compounds that help us to react quickly and ignore pain and operate at a better efficiency with increased strength for, for immediate action. Right? They help us to react to our situations. In fact, that condition is often now called reactive. Right? Fight, flight, or freeze. It's reactive. In a momentary, temporary situation, that is not a bad thing at all. So I don't want you to somehow think that being afraid or, or experiencing fear is sinful. I, I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. God is not looking at you in judgment because you have found yourself afraid or responding to your world out of a place of fear. God is not angry or disappointed in you for being a human being. That said... God does also want more for you. 
for all of us. That's why we hear uh, passages like the Apostle Paul in Romans 8.15 telling us, for you did not receive a, the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You'll notice there the opposite of fear is belonging with Christ. Or in 2 Timothy 1.7, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So God does not want us to be stuck. God did not create us for fear. Fear is a result of the breaking of God's design for us, this feeling of vulnerability of creatures that realize that they are now limited and mortal and not in control of their own reality and that we have cut ourselves off from the source. That should naturally bring in us fear. But while fear is not necessarily sinful, it can certainly be stuck full. Well, it's not a word I know, but, but there it is. We, we can get stuck there in our fear in a way that limits our life and stunts our growth, both as disciples and actually as human beings. While responding with fear is in, in an individual moment can be natural and even necessary, right? You, you should be afraid of touching fire. You should be afraid when the bear jumps out of the bushes, right? That's normal. It's a normal response. That's good because it causes us to treat fire with respect and not at the same time be freaked out about it. It, it causes us to be aware of the situations around us. And yet, when we come to a place where we are living in fear constantly, especially when there is no active threat present, but we are just mired in fear, then this ongoing emotion actually becomes destructive to us. In fact, those, those uh, you know, chemicals I mentioned earlier, cortisol and adrenaline, actually start to kill your brain cells if they're in your bloodstream for too long. See, our reactive emotions, emotions that is of, of stress, uh, fear, anger, things like that, they tend to shut down or at least downgrade the higher functionings in our brains. Things like logic, reasoning, language, relationships, empathy, compassion, all of these amazing aspects of what it means to be a flourishing human being at our best. They are shoved into the background by our reactivity, leaving us, in essence, as lesser human beings than what we are meant to be. And if that is a habitual thing, then that will be a habitual result. Right? When fear is driving our lives, love gets repressed. It gets sidelined. And that's not good for our world or for us. I mean, can you picture a world or a life where people ignore logic and reasoning, where our use of language is less about communicating or understanding one another and more about using words as weapons against one another? Can you imagine people who jettison empathy or compassion and devalue or destroy relationships because of how they're feeling in a given moment or where they isolate themselves from other people out of fear of rejection and actually in the process become kind of rejectors themselves as fear takes hold? I know it's, it's a stretch in the imagination. I, I, I probably shouldn't use sarcasm so much in sermons, but the reality is, right, this is going on all around us all the time and it's not like the pandemic caused this. This was already happening in our society. It's not good for us to be ruled by fear. So obviously the answer is simple. Do not fear. It's what the Bible says. Well, that's easier said than done though, isn't it? I mean, the world is not a safe place. We live in a world where one of the hot items going into this past school year was bulletproof backpacks. Now, it blows my mind that that's even a thing, let alone a thing that's gaining momentum in our society. But I'm, I'm especially mindful of, of the craziness in our society and its effect on the lives of the youngest among us, those who are still developing their sense of what the world should be. So uh, just a few weeks ago, the CDC Centers for Disease Control and Prevention published their most recent numbers from what they call the Youth Risk Behavior Survey or something like that. They, it's, a, it, it's a survey that they publish every two years and it tracks some of the high priority health risks for young people around the country. According to their statistics, here's just a, a couple of the statistics that like uh, stuck out to me. Three in five U.S. teen girls felt persistently sad or hopeless in this past year, 2021. 
double that of boys, representing a nearly 60% increase in the, and at the highest level since they've started recording these numbers. Nearly one in three of them, those teenage girls, seriously considered attempting suicide. One in five experienced sexual violence of some kind in the past year, not in their lives, in the past year. I'm just going to leave some of the rest of those statistics off um, just to keep it more family friendly. But there's, there's hard stuff going on in the lives of our kids. Is it any wonder some of those, those same teenage girls are saying things like, I, I don't want to go to school. School's not safe for me. Of course, that, that means that if the pressure is increasing for our children and our youth, well, we better believe that that pressure is also increasing for our parents. In fact, I, I would just like to take a moment right now to pray for our parents and grandparents and others who are raising kids right now, who are serving and loving our young people, whether in youth ministries or around town or whatever, right now. So can we just pause? Father God, um, it's a hard world for our young people. It's a hard world. And those who are caring for them are feeling the effects of that as well. Uh, we know, Lord, that you've called us for so much more than this, and we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you help us to see what is going on, that we might be uh, supportive to our young people and to those who are loving our young people, that we might walk in this together. Um, and Lord, of, of course, we know that that means older people as well, that they're also in, in, in experiencing fear, and we pray that we might see one another well, uh, support one another well, and in all things, Lord, uh, Help one another to know your love and grace and how that transforms us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I just I feel like the need to continually be lifting up our families. And I, I hope that you will be doing that as well. That the, ch that the world is changing and it is becoming increasingly hostile. Um, now, it's not the only time the world has been hostile, right? Um, uh, so for us, what does Scripture say about safety? Can we learn something from this Scripture that's thousands of years old that will actually help us in, the, in this time and place? Well, once again, safety is a major theme within the book of Psalms. The ancient Middle East was not a safe place. And so what they were experiencing was also very difficult, and they found hope and they found help within the presence of God. And they have shared their wisdom even with us. So let's go ahead and turn once again to the book of Psalms, continuing to work through the book of Psalms. Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 46, and I would just invite you to listen as God speaks to you. To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a psalm. Again, those are just the instructions for how this is to be used in the worship of Israel. Verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. You know, they actually don't know what that word Selah means, but it kind of seems to mean take a pause, take a breath, let that sink in. So let that sink in. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 
So what are our usual ways of seeking after safety in our world? I mean, we have a pretty anxious world. What are the, some of the basic ways of dealing with our anxieties, with our fears? Well, one way that people commonly choose is to try and drown it out with activities and distractions and substances, right? Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. Well, it's not going to be good. But while this practice is common, it's actually not all that helpful. The fear and anxiety doesn't go away, nor do the things that are causing it. It just keeps building and compounding, and the pressure keeps growing. And if your way of drowning out your anxiety is by watching YouTube videos, then I would highly recommend a video from the old Mythbusters show in which they took the pressure relief valve off of a hot water heater. So just Google Mythbusters hot water heater. Um, not only will it distract you for a good solid three minutes, uh, it will also show you what will most likely happen to your life if you never deal with the internal pressures that just keep building. I won't give it away, but it's pretty dramatic, and for some reason, the song Rocket Man keeps coming to mind. Or, of course, you could just try fixing all of your problems, and then you wouldn't have anything to worry about, right? As Christian writer and pastor John Mark Comer says, have fun with that one. That's just chasing after the wind. Life then becomes an endless game of whack-a-mole, right? You fix one problem, whack, and Another one, and another one, and the deepest problems just keep popping up. They, they, the deepest problems of life cannot be solved in our own power. That's even assuming that some of the things that we fear are things that are actually in our control, right? Like earthquakes. Are earthquakes making you nervous? Well, you should do something about that. Is the opioid epidemic have you down? Well, get busy. I mean, not only is it not a fix, now I feel guilty on top of it because I feel helpless on top of that because I can't do anything, or I haven't fixed that problem. And actually, is that what we see in this psalm? Fixing our problems? Is that the way to deal with our fears? Does the psalm say, therefore, we will not fear, because God will make sure that the earth never gives way? That's actually not at all what the psalm says, right? The imagery that's used here in this psalm is the ultimate picture of terrifying conditions for that, that society. So in, in ancient Israel, uh, hills and mountains, that, that, by the way, that's the same Hebrew word, uh, even though it's translated differently elsewhere. Um, but those hills and mountains were a symbol of safety and security. Think Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Well, if you actually, in the ancient world, looked up to the hills, you'd see things on those hills like fortresses and watchtowers and cities and temples because everybody built high. That, that's, it was safer up high. It's the places of safety and power and then in that society. Although, keep in mind that Psalm 121 actually doesn't say that the help comes from the hills. No, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, not from those other things. Safety is not found in the mountains or that the fortresses you build upon the mountains. In fact, in this psalm, the mountains, that, that symbol of safety and immovable solidity, the mountains are actually thrown into the heart of the sea. I've mentioned before that ancient Israel was not all that fond of the sea. Right? For them, the sea was a symbol of chaos and danger. It's terrifying. It's out of control. So this image of the very place of safety, the, this, your symbol of safety being swallowed up by chaos and danger and suddenly not safe. Does that ever feel like that's true for you? Like the thing that you counted on, that's the thing that's just been swallowed up by chaos. Well, for the psalmists, and not just in this passage, but throughout the book of Psalms, they understood that safety wasn't actually found in mountains or fortresses or cities. It was found in the presence, the presence of God. Continuing in this psalm, in the next section of the psalm, we read that there is a city, and yet it's not the city that makes me safe. It's the presence of God who's within the city that makes the city safe, let alone me. God is in the midst of her, it says. He's the, he's the metaphor of the river bringing life. And by the way, check out the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, the great promise we're all moving towards, the new Jerusalem with the river of life flowing from the throne of God through the city that we now dwell in, right? This is the picture. Our safety is found not in walls or mountains, or fortresses, or bank accounts, or whatever. Our safety is ultimately found in the one who is with us. The Lord of hosts is with us. He is our fortress, as this psalm tells us. 
This final section of the this, of this psalm looks at the craziness of the world, right? Wars and chaos and violence and danger. It's the things we see today still. And it says one more time, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. All right, this psalm is a statement of where we find our safety. God's presence, that's where we find our safety. God's power, that's where we find our safety. He is greater than anything else we might find. That's where we find our safety. God's purposes, he will make sure that what needs to happen will happen in us. Ultimately, we are safe with God. In the midst of all of this chaos, we hear this great, you know, favorite Bible passage, be still and know that I am God. You know, we love that phrase and it's because it, it helps us to quiet and that's good and we should take that passage out of context really and, and speak it to ourselves, be still and know that I am God. It's more than just about having a good quiet time though. Be still and know that I am God. Who's actually God speaking to in that, in that part of the, the psalm? Well, he's just been talking about the nations raging and wars and armies with weapons and spears and chariots and all these things. And, and then it says, be still. Like God is not speaking to us. He's actually speaking to all those forces. Be still. I'm with my children here. Be quiet now. And then he turns to us. What did you need from me, little one? Isn't that a great picture? God ceases the chaos so that we might dwell with him. We find our safety in God's presence. The heart of safety within the Jewish and Christian traditions is found within the presence of a God who sees us, who knows us, who cares and is willing to, and, and is faithful to act and to save. And that is ultimate salvation. That is the only true security. Anything else, we might even whack it down momentarily, but something else will arise or it will come back, right? It'll ultimately, we know that the forces of the world are going to overwhelm us as human beings, but they will not overwhelm the one who made us and the one who has redeemed us, the one who loves us without limits. And, you know, you can see this practiced in the life of Jesus. The harder his life became, the more dangerous his ministry got, the more he would slip away to be with his father so that he might carry within him the sense of safety, that he knew all the time who he was. So uh, neurologically, there is this mechanism within us called, uh, within humans called co-regulation. In fact, about a third of our neurons are mirror neurons, uh, causing us to connect with and align ourselves with the people around us. So when a child is afraid, what does that child first do? <gasps> what do they do? The first thing you'll see after they respond in fear is the look. What are they looking for? Well, they're usually looking for their parent, right? They're looking for their source of safety, and that source of safety is actually found in a relationship. If the parent is not you know, worried, if the, if the toddler is, a fr is frightened and they look up at their parent, and the parent is calm and not worried, then the toddler starts to feel that, and the toddler comes closer to where the parent is, that they, that they align their emotional state to be like the, the one who is their safety. By, by the way, this still doesn't stop when we grow up, that as human beings, we still look for our safety in the group of people that we find ourselves with. That's one of the, the primary things. In fact, I think besides fight, flight, and freeze, we need to add another F in there, which is flock, I think as some scientists call it. Um, but the idea that we want to be together, we're looking for faces especially. Is everybody else okay? Well, then maybe I'm okay too. People still catch our feelings from each other, no matter what age we're at. We co-regulate is the word. Of course, that flows in both ways, right? We can also have a calm person who becomes dysregulated by the stress radiating off of another person. You can watch the anxiety or the tension go within the, up within the room. So how do we learn to keep solid, to stay strong in the face of stressful powers? Well, we practice. We practice finding our safety. We practice finding our safety with each other, but we also practice by finding our safety with God. And this is what Jesus did. You know, we can co-regulate with each other, but we can also co-regulate co with God through prayer. We find our safety with the God who has said to us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
Right, John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. We hear these words from Jesus and we find within them comfort and peace. And then we go back out into our crazy world and, and yet we keep checking back in with the one who holds us. What's that now? What's reality again? <sighs> Nothing can take me out of the Father's hand. And we practice that over and over again in small, stressful situations. And so when we hit the big, stressful situation, we still say, <sighs> it's going to be okay. No one can take me out of the Father's hand. And we also find our safety with God in every moment. At, at any moment, we can turn to the truths of who God is and how God views us and find once again our safety. It's right there. Regardless of our circumstances, we can find our place in God's truths and in the felt presence of God. So when you're in worship, do you ever feel God's presence? I mean, do you ever feel, wow, God is here among us? You, you can capture that feeling and take it with you when you leave and intentionally refer back to it throughout your week you know, I felt God moving the other day. God is real. He's here with me. He's here right now. I am safe with him. And by the way, don't wait for the challenges to come. Practice on a regular basis because then you're preparing yourself for when the challenges do come. See, safety is ultimately about seeing, seeing the truth in who God is and also being seen by God. So practice being seen by God. In 2 Kings uh, 6, the prophet Elisha is being hunted by an army from the Syrians who eventually find him and surround the city with horses and chariots so he can't escape. When uh, Elisha's uh, servant starts freaking out, Elijah's response is this. He, he says to his servant, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And the servant does not see this. And so Elisha helps the servant to get an even bigger picture of, a, of an even bigger army with chariots of fire that surrounds the whole situation. He, he looks through into the spiritual reality. And then, well, I, I won't tell you the whole story, but it's about blindness and seeing. We need to be trained to train ourselves even to see the truth of who God is over and above all of the powers and the chaos and the danger that seem to circle us and press in on us. You think of 1 John 4, 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Just repeat that truth to yourself. Greater is the one who's in me than he who is in the world. And that's true all of the time. That never changes. That is always true. Matthew 28, 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. From fear to safety, not through changing our conditions, but through connecting with God through faith. You know, I, again, I'm not saying don't change your conditions if you can. Just don't let it become this game of whack-a-mole. Right? Faith is the actual firm foundation. Don't just get out of the situation. Learn that in any situation, God is there. Faith is the opposite of fear because through faith we have access to the safety, the ultimate safety that's found only in God through Christ. And Jesus himself made time to practice that presence, to practice the presence of his father in his life all the time. And so he stood secure in the midst of all of the challenges and the opposition and the sabotage and the drama that swirled around his life and his ministry. He found his rest in, in this home that is God a quiet attentiveness to his father, and an awareness of his love. But we're not left to work that all out on our own either. Quite the opposite. We are actually meant to mediate God's presence to one another. Community, so important. Again, it, it's hard to, to keep these, these principles, these five principles separate. Uh, therefore, to step into the difficulties with one another so that we might know that we're not alone is actually a gift of God. Right? We, we can't expect, for example, those parents to raise their kids in this culture, in this society, without our support. You know, all alone out there, good luck, do it by yourself, and then have that work out okay. That, that just doesn't make any sense. And um, on the other hand, we can't expect our seniors to face their health challenges or the changing life and culture without the support of a loving community, including the younger people. By the way, seniors, in, in many ways, you all have fundamentally done community better than younger generations. Not because you're better, 
but because, you know, you, that's the culture you were formed and shaped in. You just know that you're supposed to show up your na- at your neighbors with a covered dish when they get home from the hospital to see them, to, to say, hey, how can I help? And the younger generations did not always have the benefit of that cultural norm. Cultural norms, by the way, that they did not shape. The effects that we see in our given culture are usually the result of causes that come from farther upstream. So I still think that we as a church have a lot to offer one another and that we can reshape this as well. Uh, we'll talk more about that in just a few weeks when we talk about belonging, but um, it, again, it's just hard to keep uh, safety, identity, belonging, purpose, and empowerment apart from each other because they're all interrelated and interdependent. So uh, because Jesus knew that he was safe in the power and in the presence of his Father, he was also able to be safe with others. He was a safe person. And I just love how so many people felt so safe with Jesus. I mean, the most vulnerable people, the most rejected people that who've been excluded by society and beaten down and judged, these people come close to Jesus. They feel safe. They feel safe to touch him. Um, you know, children who were, you know, excluded in that society felt felt safe to come close and, and, and to sit in Jesus' lap. I mean, this is, you know, the, the woman who, who was shamed for so many years feeling safe to touch his garment. This is the, the reality of the, of the hurting people around him. They saw Jesus as a safe person. And this should be his church as well. You know, a great example of this is, is found in Luke 7, where this sinful woman crashes a dinner party thrown by a Pharisee for Jesus. And uh, in the middle of the, the dinner, she, be, she gets down on her knees and begins to anoint Jesus' feet with her tears, weeping on his feet and, uh, and with a bottle of expensive perfume and then wiping his feet with her hair. I mean, talk about a violation of personal space, right? This is intimate stuff. And the Pharisee watches and watches in judgment, stares in judgment while Jesus allows this to happen. And this is what Jesus says uh, in Luke 7, 44. Turning to the woman, towards the woman, he said to Simon the Pharisee, do you see this woman? Just let that question sink in for a second. Do you see this woman? Now, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Jesus is safe for her. He doesn't stare at her. He doesn't glare at her. He sees her and he invites, he asks us to see one another in the same way. Now, when when I was uh, much younger, I worked in a rope... uh, ropes course. I worked at a, a Christian camp that they had a ropes course, and, and I, was, I would spend many of my afternoons up there on the ropes course, uh, cranking you know, high school students or middle school students or kids through this ropes course. Uh, and of course, they're way up in the trees, so they would be scared, terrified, especially when they got to my position, which was towards the end and included some of the, the scariest elements. Um, and I found after a while that the, by far the best way of helping them through that tough time to help them overcome their fear was not to say, don't be afraid. Uh, it wasn't to say, oh, the harness has got you and to you know, rationalize it because in their mind, their, their rational uh, and you know, logical circuits are all turned off. The best way to get them through is to look them in the eyes, say, you're okay. You're not alone. We've got you. You're gonna be okay. Friends, we've got to be better at being safe with people. This world right now does not see Christians as being safe people. And therefore, the world does not feel safe with God. And I think some of the, the many ways that the world is, is truly, willfully uh, overlooking God is because they're not sure they can come to him anyway. We need, we need to make it safe to make those conversations even possible. Safety is primary. As I mentioned last week, when you're talking about those five things, if you can't get past safety, then the rest aren't going to engage anyway. So how can we help one another to be safe? How can we, I mean, I'm guessing that some people aren't even going to participate in the the triads through Lent because they're not sure it's safe. I'm not sure it's safe to unburden myself before other people. They might judge me. 
They might criticize me. They might look down on me. They might reject me. And people are carrying around that baggage all the time. How can we start to be more regularly safe people? In the midst of that safety, we're actually going to see the heart of what it means to be safe with God, who makes all safety possible. This world is not safe, but the one who rules the world, the one who will someday recreate the world, he is always safe. So let's come to him, let's be still, and know that he is God, and it's going to be okay. May God bless you this week. May you find your safety in him. Amen.
we got a pretty crazy world. But in the midst of the swirling chaos, the perceived danger, the real danger, the uncertainty, know that there is a God who is above it all, who sees you, who loves you, who knows you, and who will save and redeem you at, at the cost of his son. He will not let you go. Find your safety in him, practice that safety through the week, and then give that safety away. We pray that God would bless others through you. 